economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. If you do not understand racism, which is white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. Confuse you. white supremacy and racism. Uh, I use those two terms as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. That definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. I want you to stop this ghost stuff. TV, you're obsessed with it. The ghost channel, celebrity ghosts. The ghost touched me, I slept with the ghost. The ghost kissed me. Real ghost stories. Ghosts, ghosts, international ghosts. Ghosts that don't speak English, ghosts. White folks, there are no ghosts, there are no ghosts. It's all in your mind, get off the meth and the crack. There are no ghosts. There are no ghosts, white folks, and I can prove it. If there were ghosts, slaves would come back and fuck you up. You do know that. Something be burned, you know, by a black man, and then my God, 
you know. You see, the flag is is drenched with our blood. Because you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. We had to live on it, but we've never wanted it. So we know that this flag is drenched with our blood. So what the young people are saying now, give us a chance to be young men, respected as a man, as we know this country was built on the black backs of black people across this country. And if we don't have it, you ain't gonna have it either, cause we gonna tear it up. The testimony before the Credentials Committee, the FDP had a lineup of very different people. They had Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey, who had been killed in Neshoba County. They had Martin Luther King, everybody knew King. The seating of the delegation from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has political and moral significance far beyond the borders of Mississippi are the halls of this convention. But the highlight of the testimony was that of Fannie Lou Hamer. The sharecropper who had been evicted from her plantation had come to s symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, it was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first-class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen. The president, Lyndon Johnson, he's not <laughs> afraid of Martin Luther King's testimony. He's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testify live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Gorelsky. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago. He did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Kennedy. So he announced a nine-month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you very much. And then he leaves. And by that time, Annie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for, for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in jail. She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the SNCC field secretaries, uh, they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was a state highway patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. You see, the flag is, is drenched with our blood. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. In 1876, you have this presidential election. Rutherford Hayes, the governor of Ohio, is running for the Republicans. Samuel Tilden, ex-governor of New York at that time, is running as the Democratic candidate. And it's a very close, disputed election, somewhat like the election of 2000. And in fact, who wins hinges on who carried these three southern states, Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. Both parties claim to have carried those states. It's not clear who is elected. 
Eventually, to make a long, complicated story shorter, negotiations take place between the two parties, and this so-called compromise or bargain of 1877 is reached, in which the Democrats agree to recognize Hayes, the Republican, as the victor in the presidential election, and Hayes agrees to recognize Democratic control of those three disputed states on the state level and to pull remaining federal troops out of the South. And in effect, what Hayes is saying, we're going to end Reconstruction. The bargain is the Republican Party will control the national government, but the Democratic Party will control the South. And this means that Reconstruction is over and the rights of blacks are going to slowly be rescinded or eliminated in the South. The South. The South. The South. You see, the flag is, is drenched with our outlook. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. My daddy, the whole family, was here against their will. If you did leave, they either come get you or have somebody kill you or whatever, whatever. Jerry Dawson, he lived right in the same place we lived at home. He left, they went and got him. Bought him back, carried him right down there from his house, killed him, hung him up in a tree, casterized him and hung him up right from his house where his children, everybody could see him. I'm pretty sure it was 55, 56 when this happened. Most of us think that the end of the Civil War in 1865 closed the chapter on slavery in the American South, but that's far from the truth. Over the next 100 years, generations of black Southerners were forced to labor against their will. This new form of slavery happened in the shadows of the first half of the 20th century. And even though civil rights movement began advancing racial equality in the South in the 1950s, these practices continued secretly, making it a difficult history to prove. Today, there's one woman who's dedicated her life to finding this lost history of black identity. She's been called the slavery detective of the South. We're currently in Louisiana, about to meet Antoinette Harrell, who specializes in finding cases of essentially modern day slavery. We're really deep in the South right now. It's super swampy and super rural. I was actually born in Boston and moved to Atlanta, Georgia, like early on in my childhood. But I've never been out this far deep into Louisiana. I'm very interested in connecting with Antoinette and learning more about her work. Hi. Hello, Antoinette. Hi. Nice to meet you. Pleasure meeting you. Antoinette was born and raised in Louisiana. And even though she lost her leg to cancer a few years ago, that hasn't slowed her down from what she sees as a mission of justice, tracking down and verifying cases of slavery and abusive labor practices that happened after the Civil War. Sometimes she gets leads from newspaper clippings, old FBI reports, or recorded testimonies. And sometimes she just gets a phone call. I got scared because I seen how they beat some of the boys. They beat people to death in there. Mike, I appreciate you not taking this story to the grave with you. I know it hurt, I know it's very painful, and the state of Florida can't pay you all enough, but I'll be in touch with you shortly. A few of Antoinette's investigations have been used in court cases for reparations, though sometimes the end goal is simply to give people knowledge of their family roots, which for a lot of black Southerners is something that slavery erased. Let me first tell you how I got started with this. Researching my own family history, my family, uh, was held as slaves. Well, in 1863, my family was emancipated, and my family did become sharecroppers. Robert Harrell became a sharecropper under the system of sharecropping. The planter and the newly freed former slaves came into an agreement. I will furnish you with the seeds, with the land, a place to stay. In return, you would give me a portion of the crops. Well, not everyone did the right thing. Although sharecropping was technically legal, the practice was widely abused by white landowners who used debts to keep African Americans tied to the land that they once worked as slaves. Sharecroppers didn't pay rent, but they didn't own any property, 
And today, historians agree, sharecropping was just slavery by a different name. So many former enslaved Africans had nothing. They had no choice. At the end of the year, you owe me. No matter how hard you work, you are told, sorry. And those cases relate directly to your cases today. Right. After slavery, these are like 1921, 1930, 1940s, the 50s, and some of them to the 60s. Antoinette's very first case was May Louise Miller, a woman who was held as a slave with her entire family in Mississippi until 1961. Though May passed away in 2014, Antoinette took us to see one of her brothers, Arthur Miller. May and Arthur being two of the older sisters and brothers, they remember a lot. It took a long time before Arthur really opened up and talked. We lived on, I don't know what would you call it, but something like a plantation to me. It belonged to several different white people. They all were family, I guess. And you couldn't leave. And if you did leave, they either come get you or, or have somebody kill you or whatever, whatever. That's what, that, that's what happened. They did my mama bad. What'd they do to your mother? They just had my mother, you know, the white men. You know, they, they, they just do what they want to do with them. And uh, I just wasn't big enough to do nothing. If I would have been, I don't know, probably wouldn't be. And this was in the 1950s or 40s? That was on through the 40s, in the 50s, all through the 50s, in part of the 60s. So what would the repercussions be if you tried to leave or if you tried to refuse what they wanted? Back in them days, it's, 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 it was kind of like you had to do what the white man said or i get killed. My dad is uncle. He made him dig a grave and killed him. <laughs> the what? They killed him and buried him in his own grave. Jerry Dawson, they killed him. He lived around the same place we lived at home. He left and said he wasn't coming back. They wouldn't got him. Bought him back, cut him right down there from his house, killed him. Hung him up in a tree. They hung him? They killed him first, casterized him, and hung him up right from his house where he's cheering everybody could see him. Were you aware that this is 1940s, 1950s, that <laughs> this is insane. Um, Arthur, this is, this is, this breaks my heart to hear this story. Um, growing up, did you, were you fully aware, this is in the 40s and 50s, you know, the civil rights movement is just about to begin. Were you aware of what was going on in the rest of the country? at that time for black people pursuing freedom? No. You, had, you weren't aware at all that this was, there was any pursuit for freedom in the 40s and 50s for us? No, not really. Not really, because I think maybe like in 65, 66, then they was doing that marching. You know, that's when I really found out. The people are scared to talk about it. it, it it's people right now y'all go to talk to. They won't talk with y'all about this here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're scared to do it. They got their fear in them, uh-huh. How could something like this happen? A lot of these places that was in very isolated rural areas, it was easy. I mean, you had the opportunity to ride through some of these areas and you saw for miles and miles, there's absolutely nothing. You think, like, how can somebody not just escape these type of conditions? And once you actually are out here, you see there is nothing but cotton fields and crops and long strips of road where, where can you fathomably go? It's insane to see how you can be trapped on this land on so many different levels, whether it be economically, physically, and, and even mentally. We're calling on the world in terms of righteousness reparations. Antoinette's work for Arthur's family got the attention of a lawyer in 2001, and they became part of a class action lawsuit for reparations. But ultimately, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and the pursuit for reparations has since been dropped.
How you doing, ma'am? My name is Antoinette Harrell, and I'm a historian. Hey, how y'all doing? I got a question. Can I ask you something right quick? The lady in the next block told me there used to be a store where people used to share crop or work on somebody's land. Do anybody know that story? Is that how you do a lot of your work, just going out and talking hey. to the community? Hey, how you doing? A kill come with me. Yeah? Did you ever pick cotton? Oh, yeah. I mean, it take me a whole day to get to one. One of Antoinette's new cases took us to the ball ground plantation to meet a man named Donald Jeffrey. Donald comes from five generations of sharecroppers who worked the same land under the Simrel family. Donald still lives here, along with the last descendant of the Simrel family, a man named Karsten. Today, Donald works full time on another farm, but still lives rent free on this plantation and does odd jobs for Karsten. So their living situation is unconventional to say the least. Why is Donald so nervous? Like we're pretty uh, inconspicuous right now. Because but I, don't think, I don't think he wants the boss man to see us here. Hey Donald. Hey there Donald, nice How to you meet doing? you. Hey, good to see you. My mama's dad and when they come along in their time, they will share crop them. What kind of work was done on this plantation? Everything, fooling with cows, horses, and farming. What kind of work did your mother do on the plantation? She mostly did maiden work, did cooking. She told me at 14 years old, she started chopping cotton, and she would leave out the cotton field at a quarter, 20 minutes, 11, and cook a dinner to have it ready at 12. Why did you not leave the plantation? Because it was home to me. And I, you know, I love it here. It's a beautiful place. And I, you know, just didn't leave. You know, you're responsible for your light bill, but you don't pay no water bill or no rent. So, I mean, it's all, it works out. So what is your relationship to this plantation? Born and raised here, and Carson, I, he's almost like a brother to me. I mean, we have a, a real close relationship, a bond. So there's a brotherhood between you and Carson? Mm-hmm. Like family? Yeah, we are. That's right. We like family, sure is. We like brothers. I can go right there now and spend the night in his house. All the people that work on this plantation, he refused to put them off. He would let them stay here. Yeah, right. And that's how you, you end up staying. That's right, staying. Do I feel like he's holding back some things? Yes, I do. But he lives here, and he have to stay here when I'm gone. And I don't want to put anybody's life in jeopardy, you know, because this can happen. I mean, you know, if you're talking about things that people don't want to be told. There's always someone that don't want you to talk about something. That night, I spoke with Karsten about his family's history on the plantation. Hey there, Karsten. Hey there, what y'all got going on? How's it going, man? Akil. Hey nice there. to meet you. What nice you to meet you. Oh, oh, thanks for letting us, uh, you know, showing us around. Yeah, man. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, Come good on to see inside. You too. All right, great. Y'all want anything to eat or anything? Y'all want any beer? Coke, it's cola? It's fine. It's Seven fine. Up, tea? Oh, it's fine. It's fine. If we could just do a little tour, that'd be amazing. And okay. just to talk a little bit about the history of right. uh, Ball Ground Plantation. This is yes. my wife, Natalie. Hi, nice to meet Welcome you. To and then I would say the Semro family goes a, goes a long way out here, right? Yes. My family bought this place in 1899. So if I'm, see, five, I'm the fifth generation. What is your relationship with Donald? I don't even remember meeting him. Honest to God, we were childhood friends. No joke. I promise to God. Are you related to this man right here? Yes. That is my great, great, Great grandfather. And what, what time period is this? Ooh, that would probably be in the 30s. This, this man right here was related to Donald, correct? That's Eli. What, what kind of work was he doing at that time? Was he just like a general helper for your great grandfather? Just, just anything. He, he'd just do anything. And if anybody fooled with him, they had a hell to pay. And so is he still with just us? Just like nobody fooled with Donald, so they know I will. <laughs> Kill him. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the land as well? Back then, it was very little open land, okay? Because every, every home had their own little allotment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? 
like say that you were living on my farm, okay? Mm -hmm. Rent free, okay? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Honest to God. I mean, who who wouldn't do that? Mm -hmm. Shit. I mean, everybody else was charging their people. Right, so they just worked the crops and didn't have to pay rent on this land. Never, ever. Uh, that was the thing, because Donald was explaining a little bit about his, mm -hmm. his history and his experience and growing up Donald's here. sometimes Donald's full of shit. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> And was, you don't have to edit that either. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that there's some Confederate dollars here. Did your family have a lot of ties to the Confederate Army? Not really. Just no. had the currency? What misconceptions are there, do you feel, about no. the Confederate Army? Here it is right here. You can read it. The Southern nation, the rise of the Old South. This, it says the South was right. It was written by two, two Kennedy brothers. This is about the South being right during the Civil War. I'm not trying to push the book, but it's proven. I mean, you can talk to anyone. anyone. You see, the flag is, is drinks without blood. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. Fannie Lou Hamer was a force to be reckoned with, enduring intractable racism, police beatings, and even forced sterilization. She never stopped working for equal voting rights for all. This is the tragic real-life story of Fannie Lou Hamer. Born on October 6, 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi, Fannie Lou was the 20th and youngest child of Lou Ella and James Townsend. Both Luella and James worked as sharecroppers their entire lives. When Fannie Lou was just six years old, she joined them despite having endured a bout of polio just a year earlier. Hamer was eight years old in 1925 when she saw Joe Pullum, a local sharecropper, lynched. In an interview with Jack O'Dell in 1965, she said, I remember that until this day and I won't forget it. Poverty forced Hamer to drop out of school at the age of 12 and by the age of 13, she was picking as much as 400 pounds of cotton in a day and receiving $1 for her work. Since Hamer had learned how to read and write during her brief time in school, she also worked as a record keeper on the plantation and soon discovered just how the owners would cook the books to cheat the poor sharecroppers out of their fair wages. To offset this, Hamer began secretly tilting the scales to ensure people weren't cheated. She later recalled, I didn't know what to do, and all I could do was rebel in the only way I could rebel. In 1944, Fannie Lou married Perry Pap Hamer, a tractor driver on a local plantation. 17 years later, in 1961, she underwent surgery to remove a small cyst in her stomach. When she woke, she discovered that she'd also been given a hysterectomy without her consent. According to PBS, this type of forced sterilization was so common at the time that it became referred to as a Mississippi appendectomy, a term coined by Hamer herself. On June 8, 1964, Hamer testified before a panel in Washington, D.C. that at the North Sunflower County Hospital, six out of the ten Negro women that go to the hospital are sterilized with the tubes tied. Forced sterilizations have a dark history and an equally dark present in the United States. Indiana passed the first forced sterilization law in 1907, and while they hit their peak in the 1930s and 1940s, targeting those deemed to be criminals or unfit by the 1950s, sterilization laws started targeting welfare recipients as well. Forced sterilizations were frequently racially motivated. This became abundantly clear when Mississippi proposed a bill that would make it a felony for a parent on welfare to have more than one child jail time could be avoided if the parent consented to sterilization. Ultimately, sterilization was removed from that bill, but untold women like Hamer still were sterilized without their consent. On August 31, 1962, Hamer and 17 others went to the courthouse in Indianola, Mississippi to register to vote. According to PBS, most of the group was blocked from even attempting to register. Only Hamer and one other man were allowed to fill out an application and take a literacy test. At the time, literacy tests were purposefully designed to keep black people from voting. And when Hamer was asked to explain de facto laws, she later recalled that, I know as much about a facto law as a horse knows about Christmas Day. After failing the literacy test, the group was denied the right to register to vote. 
On the way home, their bus was stopped by police and fined $100 for being too yellow. Then the persecution got worse. The owner of the plantation where Hamer worked and lived demanded that she withdraw her application to vote. Mr. Marlowe told me that I would have to go down and withdraw my registration or leave because they wasn't ready for that in Mississippi. Hamer refused and was immediately thrown off the plantation where she had lived and worked for 18 years. She temporarily stayed with a friend before finding a new home and just narrowly missed being murdered by those who were trying to suppress the black vote. They shot in the house 15 times thinking that I was there. On January 10th, 1963, Hamer was finally able to pass the literacy test. According to The Nation, after her second attempt on December 4th, she told the registrar, quote, you'll see me every 30 days till I pass. A month later, she passed. But despite now being registered to vote, she discovered that she still wasn't allowed to vote because she didn't have any poll tax receipts. In some parts of the United States, people were required to pay a tax in order to vote a tax put in place to ensure that the poorest people, who were often people of color, didn't get a voice in the government. And they weren't subtle about this fact either. For instance, in 1939, Alabama's Tuscaloosa News published an editorial that read in part, this newspaper believes in white supremacy, and it believes that the poll tax is one of the essentials for the preservation of white supremacy. In 1962, the United States passed the 24th Amendment, which outlawed poll taxes for federal elections. Despite this, Hamer was still denied the right to vote a year later because it wasn't really enforced until 1965. And to this day, eight states, including Mississippi, still haven't ratified the amendment. While Papp worked to pay off their sharecropping debt at the plantation, Hamer continued working toward voter registration and desegregation. On June 9, 1963, Hamer and nine other activists were returning on a bus from a voter registration and civic education training session in Charleston, South Carolina. The activists had tried to integrate lunch counters at the various bus stations along their way home, and their protests had enraged their bus driver. According to Fannie Lou Hamer, America's Freedom Fighting Woman by Megan Parker Brooks, the driver began using the phone at every stop reporting their location to Mississippi police. In Winona, Mississippi, police arrested at least six of the activists, even those who'd remain on the bus, and took them to jail. Hamer and her fellow activists weren't released from jail until June 12th. And in those three days, Hamer sustained such severe and prolonged beatings that she suffered from lifelong damage to her kidneys, eyes, and legs. In addition to beating the activists themselves, police also forced the other black people who were also imprisoned in the jail at the time to beat the activists as well. While there was later a brief trial, the police were cleared for their actions. After several failed attempts to work with the all-white pro-segregation Mississippi Democratic Party, Hamer co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And in 1964, she went to the Democratic National Convention in an attempt to get representation. As a result, she received death threats. When she reported them to the police, they told her, quote, don't look to us for help. On August 22, 1964, Hamer testified before the Credentials Committee at the Democratic National Convention. She started by stating her full name and home address, defiantly signaling her fearlessness to every white supremacist. According to the Washington Post, President Johnson was terrified that her testimony at the convention would break up the coalition of white Southern delegates he needed to get elected. He tried to convince her not to speak, but when she did anyway, he abruptly called a pointless live press conference so the TV broadcast would have to cut away from Hamer's testimony. It backfired, bringing more media attention to Hamer's testimony than it otherwise might have gotten, with many evening news programs giving full coverage of the speech that Johnson had interrupted. As a result of pressure from President Johnson and vice presidential candidate Hubert Humphrey, the convention refused to accept Hamer as an official delegate. Instead, officials offered a farcical compromise to the MFDP. They'd be allowed two delegates, but they could neither sit in the Mississippi section, nor would they be able to cast votes. Oh, and neither one of those seats were allowed to go to Hamer. Why? According to Humphrey, the president has said he will not let that illiterate woman speak on the floor of the Democratic convention. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party voted unanimously to reject the administration's compromise. In Hamer's words, quote, 
we didn't come all this way for no two seats. They returned to Mississippi, shut out once again by a process meant to empower them. In 1964, Hamer also ran unsuccessfully for Congress. According to an interview with Jack O'Dell, Hamer recalled that it was harder for her to pass the literacy test in order to register to vote than it was for her to qualify to run for Congress. And despite being barred from the official ballot, the MFDP gave out freedom ballots that included candidates of all races. According to Smithsonian Magazine, after her first bid was unsuccessful, Hamer ran for office two more times in 1967 and 1971. Unfortunately, her 1967 run was disqualified on a technicality, and she lost to the incumbent in 1971. She did have one moment of triumph, though. In 1968, the Democratic Party began requiring equal representation for state delegations, and she finally was recognized as an official delegate for Mississippi at the National Democratic Party Convention. She used her platform to protest the ongoing war in Vietnam. Seeing that not much progress was being made on the political front, Fannie Lou Hamer turned most of her attention toward economic justice as a way to fight for racial equality. In 1969, Hamer founded the Freedom Farm Cooperative in order to provide Black people with land that they could own and farm collectively. With the help of donors such as the Measure for Measure organization and Harry Belafonte, by 1970, the co-op had amassed 680 acres for cultivation. Membership for the co-op was a dollar a month, and even though only 30 families could afford the dues, those who couldn't pay weren't excluded. Roughly an additional 1,500 families were also part of the Freedom Farm Cooperative in name. In 1970, the collective also started a pig bank for impoverished families. With help from the National Council of Negro Women, the collective purchased five male pigs and 35 female pigs. And over the next three years, thousands of pigs made their way to black families. Hamer especially loved the pig bank, stating that, quote, I wouldn't take nothing for our golden pigs. Unfortunately, without institutional backing or resources, the Freedom Farm Collective only lasted a handful of years. But at its height, it was one of the largest employers in Sunflower County, Mississippi. According to the Center for Constitutional Rights, Hamer was actually partly responsible for the Voting Rights Act's passage thanks to her 1965 civil rights case, Hamer v. Campbell. Brought against the circuit clerk of Mississippi for restricting black people's right to register and vote, Hamer's victory in court even allowed the elections to be overturned due to their discriminatory practices. Even after the Voting Rights Act was finally passed in 1965, Fannie Lou Hamer continued to focus on equal voting rights. Despite the federal protections that the Voting Rights Act claimed to guarantee, though, white people in power continued to try to prevent black people from registering and voting. Still, she fought on. According to PBS, in 1970, Hamer organized plaintiffs for a class action lawsuit regarding school desegregation in Sunflower County. This suit resulted in the district court ordering the county to merge its segregated schools into a single public school system. Fannie Lou Hamer's health suffered during her final years. In 1976, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a radical mastectomy. She continued her civil rights work as long as she could, but as her health worsened, fundraising and public speaking became more and more difficult. Hamer died on March 14, 1977. Her life cut tragically short at the age of 59. Hundreds of people came to pay their respects, but some regretted the media circus that transpired. According to Fannie Lou Hamer, The Life of a Civil Rights Icon by Ernest N. Bracey, some of her fellow activists believed that dignitaries looking for a photo op ended up overshadowing coverage of Hamer's life and work and the mourning being done by her real friends, family, and neighbors. Hamer was buried at the Freedom Farm Cooperative, and her gravestone bears her famous motto, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one. You see, you see the flag is, is drenched with our outlook. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. Remember, Johnson said, there's America, there's the South, and then there's Mississippi. The Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission was Mississippi's spy agency during the Civil Rights Movement. 
the uh, Sovereignty Commission wanted to know who the activists were in the black community. One of those alone whole nine foot sacks. They were out to stop overt efforts at integration. Down in Mississippi. It's state government itself. We're not just talking about some rednecks on the street are pulling us off. This is defined at its highest levels. We knew we were being followed. I knew my life is in danger. This is still the United States of America, and you don't treat American citizens this way. How far the Sovereignty Commission went in terms of crossing legal lines, I think it is accurate to say that uh, they cross them all the time. Way down in Mississippi Jerry Mitchell, what were you most surprised by in the documents that you got? Well, uh, lots of things. The fact that they had spied on, on so many activists, the fact they had spied on mega revers and later tried to help, this, help uh, basically quit the killer in that case, as well as uh, reports on my own newspaper uh, from back in the 50s and 60s. So that was interesting as well. Don Porter, why did you decide to m turn this into a film? Um, you know, when I first heard this story, that there was not only a spy agency, a government spy agency, but that there were also African-American activists who were involved in the spying, I thought, that's a piece of civil rights history that isn't widely known, but it fills in a lot of the missing, it connects the dots in a lot of ways. Um, and I thought people would be interested in it. And I. Um, I just was fascinated by the lengths that state government will go to subvert democracy. I want to go to a clip from your film, from Spies of Mississippi, about one of the people who was spied on by the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. We hear from historian Neil McMillan, author Rick Bowers, and Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson, who was an activist at the time. It begins, well, with our guest uh, in Jackson, Jerry Mitchell. I'll never forget finding the file on Clyde Kennard the young man whose great crime against the state of Mississippi was to apply to go to college. Clyde Kennard was a Korean War veteran, an upstanding citizen who had studied uh, in the northern universities and uh, who was very ambitious and a profoundly decent and, and, and good guy. In the 50s, Clyde Kennard tried to go to the University of Southern Mississippi. In the 1950s, the few African Americans in the South who were able to enroll in college could only attend black schools. Kennard's application to attend Mississippi Southern was seen as an attack on segregation and set into motion a swift response from the state. His application was given to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, an organization few Mississippians even knew existed. They did a report that tracked his background growing up in Mississippi, his time spent with his family in Chicago, his time in the military, his time at the University of Chicago, and his time back in Mississippi helping his ailing mother on her chicken farm. With multiple agents, tracking everybody in his background. They couldn't come up with anything that could undercut his application to go to college. The police, with the cooperation of the State Sovereignty Commission, planted stolen chicken feed from the county co-op, but some, about 20 bucks worth of chicken feed were planted on his farm. He didn't steal them, everybody knows that. But he was arrested for that and he was put in prison for seven years. He was sentenced to Parchment Penitentiary, the worst prison at that time, probably in the country. They 
they let him out a couple months before he died of cancer, but only because he was terminal. That sovereignty commission did all they could to hold back progress in our state and basically discourage any kind of uh, 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 efforts to bring black and white people together. That last voice, uh, Congress member Benny Thompson. Uh, this is a clip from Spies of Mississippi, directed by Don Porter. So talk more about the Sovereignty Commission, Don. Um, so the Sovereignty Commission is established in response to Brown versus Board of Education, the famous Supreme Court case that allows integration of schools. Um, that case was seen by Mississippi um, as almost a declaration of war. It uh, was viewed as an attack on Mississippi's sovereignty um, and set into motion a vast response from the state. One of the things they did was establish this spy agency. Um, and I think what's so remarkable about this is it was a spy agency hidden in plain sight. Uh, there was an allocation of taxpayer dollars, $250,000, which in 1950s money is serious money. There's an offer Office that reports to the governor of Mississippi, um, and one of the things they did was hire spies. So in the early years, what you see in the 50s is exactly what happens to Clyde Kennard. Um, his crime was applying to go to a white school. And I thought um, it's such wonderful tie-in to the segment you just did about how uh, when a state government feels that its authority, its directions are being uh, challenged, that anything goes. And so they literally ruined this young man's life. I think he had come from the University of Chicago. He wanted to be near his family. Um, he wanted to continue his education and to deliberately plant evidence in order to arrest him and sentence him to prison. Um, I think is just. Uh, I wish it was more shocking, but it's certainly terrible. This is another clip from Spies of Mississippi featuring. Horace Harded, a member of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, beginning with a promotional video about the Jackson Police Department leading up to Freedom Summer. The Jackson Police Department operates with the best demonstration deterrent of any city in the country. In addition to Thompson's tank, armor-plated and equipped with nine machine gun positions, the arsenal includes cage trucks for transporting masses of arrested violators. Searchlight trucks, each of which can light three city blocks in case of night riots. Police dog teams, trained to trail, search a building, or disperse a mob or crowd. Mounted police, for controlling parades and pedestrian traffic. And compounds and detention facilities to hold and house 10,000 prisoners. Along with these ironclad police facilities, there are new ironclad state laws outlawing picketing, economic boycotting, and demonstrating. Other laws to control the printing and distribution of certain types of information, and laws to dampen complaints to federal authorities. We call out the highway patrol and the guard and people like that to keep them in line. We kept them in line. We locked up a lot of them, put them in jail for disorderly conduct, that sort of thing. The jails in Jackson were full, and several other places we had them. I don't mind coming to jail, I don't mind suffering at all. And I will suffer some more just for my freedom. I want equal rights. I want equal rights. We were not intimidated. And I think that's important. If you get intimidated, you can't control anything. That's Horace Harded, a member of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. Um, if Jerry Mitchell, if you could talk about uh, who he was and the significance of this commission in, in your state of Mississippi. Well, it was, it was a very powerful commission. It was actually headed by the governor of the state and the state's most powerful leaders. You had uh, people who were in the, le you know, the most powerful members of the legislature, the lieutenant governor, uh, you know, all these people that, you know, held the highest offices basically had control of this agency, which had uh, law enforcement powers, had uh, judicial powers uh, to subpoena, to get anything they wanted. Uh, it was uh, frightening from a, from a power perspective. Uh, you know, they had the blessings of the governor on down. 
I want to go to a clip of R. L. Bolden, who was the former vice president of the Mississippi NAACP, who many believe was Agent X, who reported to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. They claim that I was a spy. That, that was a lie. I wasn't no spy. I was worse than shot. I didn't realize that kind of information was out there because it wasn't true. It's possible that the detective agency was passing on information. I knew R.L. very well. He was the vice president of the state NAACP, and he was intimately involved with us, and we didn't have any signs or indication that he was to the contrary. It was only through the diligence of late, sen late Senator Henry Kirksey who began to pinpoint things to determine that he was working with the, the State Sovereign Commission. And that had to do with uh, him digging off into the files and looking at reports and seeing reports being given about certain specific meetings and him reco recollecting who was at the meeting. And everybody's Everybody that attended that meeting were mentioned except one person that he knew was there. And that's when he came to the conclusion that since this is a pattern, that one person who is not mentioned at these meetings that I know was there have to be the one that's submitting the report. That civil rights activist Hollis Watkins talking about R.L. Bolden who is the former vice president of the Mississippi NAACP. And it turns out, once the documents were released, it was revealed that he was one of the spies recruited by the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. Don Porter, talk more about R.L. Bolden, his significance, and with the missing uh, three civil rights activists, Schroner, Cheney, and Goodman. Um, you know, th so the Sovereignty Commission initially starts by having white agents, former FBI men. Then they move on to have high-profile African Americans. Those African Americans were revealed. Um, their identities were revealed. And so the commission realized it needed ordinary people. So R.L. Bolden ended up being an ordinary American, extraordinary spy. He infiltrated the highest levels of the civil rights movement. He was at a very important training that the civil rights activists conducted before Freedom Summer. So In Ohio. In Ohio. So in Ohio, all the students that were about to go south were brought together, and Bolden was at that meeting. He gave the license plate and the pictures of the civil rights workers, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. Um, other people also gave the, this information, but he, we know that he gave this information to his handlers. His handlers turned that over to the Mississippi police, and who were infiltrated by the Klan. The significance of that is, I think that the way the Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner murders are often described, it's as if they were pulled over randomly for being in an interracial car, which couldn't have been farther from the truth. They were being targeted by the Sovereignty Commission. Their every move was watched. This was quite a deliberate act to pull them over, um, and you know it results in their murders. It results in their deaths, and one of the most important important events of the civil rights movement, um, which began, which did actually open up Mississippi. But what a tragic way to do it. Jerry Mitchell, what were you most surprised by in these documents uh, that you got, uh, especially around this issue of the recruiting of people within the movement and then those not necessarily in the movement? I want to play one more clip, but who were African American and were leaders and were seen as part of the movement. Let's go back to Spies in Mississippi. This clip includes Lawrence Giat, a civil rights activist in Mississippi since 1961. It starts, though, with Rick Bowers, author of the book Spies in Mississippi. Anytime there's a great freedom movement, there are people who end up on both sides. And if we could transport ourselves back to Mississippi at that time, it was a confusing time. There were many shades of opinion on all the issues related to civil rights. We had a lot of people who felt that there was no way that the civil rights movement could possibly win. 
So why not get on the winning side early? And others will say, well, the government asked me to do it. Therefore, it has to be legal. The government doesn't do illegal things, does it? Lauren Skiat, the civil rights activist in Mississippi since 1961, Jerry Mitchell. Talk more about what they're saying. Well, uh, the, you know, you, you have these spies that, that, that are hired by detective agencies. That's basically how the Sovereignty Commission is able to operate and kind of keep one a bit of distance, if that makes any sense, between them and the spies. So the, the detective agency is reporting back to them, and they actually don't record the name of the spy in the files. Uh, and so that's the way they, they kind of operated and were able to, to pull this off. Um, and I might add, you know, some, they're actually in case of like B.L. Bell, uh, he actually volunteered his services, which I, I know seems very odd, but one of the reasons and one of the motivations for some of these spies was money. They were being paid. Uh, Percy Green, who is an editor for the Jackson Advocate, was actually sent up north and, and, and paid to speak. And he, he and other speakers like him would say things like, oh, you know, we love Mississippi, we love segregation, we love the way it is right now. And so that, the idea behind this is not just spies, but also spreading propaganda, which, of course, like I said, was paid for. Um, the pastors involved, very painful part of the story. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Uh, so Reverend H. H. Hume, really influential pastor, um, a huge congregation and a radio audience in Mississippi. And you have to remember at that time, it was really difficult for African Americans to get that kind of influence. Um, it turns out that he was providing information to him. Um, and I think it speaks to, you know, what Jerry said. Um, there's a particular kind of betrayal when your spiritual leader and a person everyone wants to emulate and look up to turns out to be an, uh, an informant. What do you hope to accomplish with this film, Tom? You know, um, I really hope everyone is outraged by finding out their spies um, during a movement like the Civil Rights Movement uh, that we all now agree led to great freedoms. Um, but I really love the segment you just did. And I think that there's a tie in history. These tactics are not new. The, f the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment are not convenient. You cannot sometimes have democracy. You need to, you know, these are actually really enemies of our Constitution. And I think that those, when those tactics are still happening today, we need to understand that history. history. My home is in Rooseville, Mississippi. It's located in the Black Belt of Mississippi, known as the Delta area. I was forced away from the plantation because I wouldn't go back and withdraw, you know, my literacy test after I had tried to take it. I wouldn't go back and I had to leave and my husband was forced to stay on this plantation until after the harvest season was over and then the man that we had worked for, he'd taken the car and the most of the few things we had had been stolen and I'd been in jail and I'd been beat. I had been to a voter registration workshop, you know, to they were just training and teaching us how to register, to pass the literacy test. And it was giving us enough training that we could tell other people, you know, how to pass the literacy test. So we had attended a workshop from the 3rd of June to the 8th. And then we got the uh, Continental Trailway bus to come back to Mississippi. And we got to uh, Winona, Mississippi, uh, I would say about 10.30 that Sunday morning on our way back to Greenwood. And that was, we had got in 25 miles of the voter registration headquarters. And the bus stopped in Winona, you know, at the bus terminal. And four people got off of the bus, you know, to use the uh, restaurant to get food. And two people got off, used the washroom while I was still on the bus. When I looked through the glass, I saw the people rush out. And one of the girls who had gone in the washroom, she just got back on the bus. And I stepped off to see what had happened. And uh, Miss Punda told me that it was a state highway patrolman and a chief of police on the inside and began to tap them on the shoulders with billy clubs and ordered them to get out. And I said, well, this is Mississippi. So I got back on the bus, and as soon as I was seated, 
I saw them when they began to put the five people what was, you know, off the bus, but they wasn't over uh, six feet from the bus, began to put them in the highway patrolman's car. And I stepped off again because I was holding one of the ladies' urns, you know, that they was arresting. And she said, get back on the bus, Miss Hamer. And then I heard somebody scream from the car that she was in and said, get that one there. And then a white man stepped out of a car and told me I was under arrest. And when he opened the door and I went to get in the car, he kicked me. And they carried me on down to the county jail where they had the other highway patrolman had carried the other five. And they, you know, when I, we walked in, when I walked in with the two white men that had carried me down and they cursed me all the way down, they would ask me questions and when I would try to answer, they would tell me to hush. And I, when, we, when I walked inside of the booking room, one of the policemen went over and jumped up on one of the Negroes' feet that was with us. And then they just began to, you know, put us in cells. And I was put in a cell with Miss Vesta Simpson. And after I was put in the cell, I could just hear some horrible screams and horrible sounds, you know, of licks. And I saw one of the girls was 15 years old, was with us. And she passed my cell, and she was real bloody. And then they asked the little man that cleaned up the jail to go inside and mop up that blood. And then I heard some more screaming, and I heard some awful sounds. And I would hear somebody when they say, can't you say yes, sir, nigger? Can't you say yes, sir? And they would call her names that I wouldn't want to go on tape. And she said, yes, I can say yes, sir. So I said. And she said, I don't know you well enough. And I would hear when she would hit the floor again. And finally, she began to pray. And she asked God to have mercy on these people because they didn't know what they was doing. And after a while, they passed my cell door with this young woman, Miss Annelle Ponder. And one of her eyes looked like blood. And her hair was standing up on her head and her clothes had been torn from the shoulder down to the waist. And then three white men came to my cell. And one of them was a state highway patrolman because he was wearing a little silver plate across his pocket that said John L. Bassinger. And he asked me where I was from. And I told him I was from Rouville. And he said, I'm going to check that. And he went out. And I guess he called Rouville. And they did, didn't like me in Rouville because I worked with voter registration there. And when he came back, he said, you damn right, they said, you're from Rouville, all right. And we gonna make you wish you was dead. And they led me out of that cell into another cell. And he gave a Negro prisoner a blackjack. And he ordered me to lay down on a bunk bed. And a Negro prisoner said, do you want me to beat her with this, sir? And he said, you're damn right, because if you don't, you know what I'll do for you. And I laid down on the bunk like he ordered me to do. And the first Negro beat me. He beat me until he was exalted. And after he beat, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. And during the time he was beating, I began to work my feet because that was a horrible experience. And the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro that had beat to sit on my feet while the second one beat. And I just began to scream where I couldn't control it. And then the white man got up and began to beat me in my head. I have a blood clot now in the outer to the left eye and a permanent kidney injury on the right side from that beat. These are the things that we go through in the state of Mississippi, just trying to be treated like a human being. But still, this is called a part of America. The Justice Department brought a suit against these five law officials from Mississippi. And they had their trial in Oxford. And they had every evidence in the world if it ever was going to be any people convicted. Because we had flew to Washington, D.C. and had the pictures made, and they had the pictures today of what happened to us in that jail. The bus driver. They even had the waitresses from Winona 
at the uh, bus tournament that said we hadn't done anything. We hadn't done no demonstration. The Negroes that they forced to beat me, they came and they told the truth. They told how these white men had made them drink corn whiskey before they did beat us because they figured, you know, if they didn't have something in them, that they might not do it. They told all of that and nothing have been done. Those same men, I guess, are still wearing their guns. They are very powerful in the state of Mississippi. But some of the people, I think, is beginning to get where now they just don't care. They are beginning to see if they try to do anything for themselves, well, they'll be killed anyway, because it's nowhere that I would call myself going in the state of Mississippi to be protected by a police official because they are worse than a savage. As you know, the three civil rights workers that was murdered in Mississippi, they said their civil rights hadn't been violated, that they are dead. In fact, the same men, uh, Rainey and Price, was assisting the people across the street when they was having memorial service this year for Cheney and Goodman and Michael Strona. And Michael Strona was a Jewish person, but he was one of the greatest men I ever met. I knew him very well and his wife, Rita. And, and you know, I couldn't have went there for a memorial service, not and let these same two police officials guard me across the street. I wouldn't have been low enough to low their death to go across the street, let them guard me across the street. When if it hadn't been for them, they wouldn't have been dead. The way I got involved in the Freedom Democrat Party is we tried to get in the regular Democrat Party, we tried from the precinct level up to the county and from the county to the state. I remember when we tried to attend the precinct meeting at the little polling place in Louisville, it was eight of us, eight Negroes, went up to visit the precinct meeting, and the door was locked, and we couldn't get in. And we stood on the outside and held our own meeting. If we hadn't tried to go in it, and then just set this one up, they would have said from the beginning, if we had tried, we could have got in theirs. We elected our chairman and our secretary, our delegates and our alternates, and we passed a law to resolution. The 24th of April in 1964, we organized at the Masonic Temple in Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Freedom Democrat Party. And then the 24th of August in 1964, we went to the National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, to challenge the seating of the regular delegation from Mississippi. We got quite an education and seeing what the whole Democrat Party of this country was like. I, in fact, I cried. I don't know would I really been involved in politics now if I had known it was like it is. We was offered two votes at large as a compromise in the convention, but after 100 years, we wouldn't accept a compromise because it didn't mean anything to 63,000 people at that time was registered with the Freedom Democrat Party, so we didn't yeah. compromise. So again, in January, beginning the 4th of January, the three candidates from the Freedom Democrat Party, Mrs. Gray, Mrs. Devine, and I went up before the door of the House of Representatives to contest the seating of yeah. the five representatives from Mississippi and we was turned away, and we wasn't allowed to even go in to have, you know, to contest our seating. We didn't go there to be seated because we knew from the beginning that we wouldn't be seated, but we wanted to explain our side, whereas in a state that 42% of the people can't register, they wasn't representing us, and I think somebody, it's time now for somebody to be in Congress that's gonna represent the people of Mississippi. And we weren't allowed to go inside, but that didn't stop the challenge. We did have that day 149 congressmen that stood up against these people being seated. So we are still working with this challenge, and we hope by the last of this month, which is August, 
that we will have a chance to unseat these congressmen because actually this voting bill that the president passed last week, it doesn't mean anything. And I'm not looking for a voting bill in 1965 when they are not enforcing the voting bill and our voting rights with the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed us the same rights to vote from the 15th Amendment in 1870. And at that time, 1870, Mississippi was readmitted back to the Union because they promised at that time that they wouldn't do anything to disenfranchise Negroes to keep them from registering to vote. So now it's a matter of a violation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And what I'm curious to see do the Constitution, the Constitution of the United, of the United States, States mean anything? Mean anything, anything. You, see, you see, the flag, the flag is, is drenched with our blood. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. 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 Today it's time to stop singing and start swinging. We are coming, we are coming to get our check. You are now listening to P A R. That's People Activity Radio, and I'm your host, host John. John. G, G, four, four, you have found your family family. in a peaceful play, play. PAR is a family-friendly information distribution program seeking to inform non-white people in particular, black classified and assisting in counter racist codification. The title of today's episode is Fannie Lou Hamer, Freedom Farms Co op, and a myth of black American cowardice. Let me repeat that title one more time. The title of today's episode is Fannie Lou Hamer, Freedom Farms Co op. And a myth of black American cowardice. Let's get it in. You are now listening to PAR. That's People Activity Radio. Hosted by John G. Horse. A blue collar commentary radio podcast attempting to remove confusion in everyday social events. If you are subject to non white classification, in particular black classified, welcome. You have found your family in a peaceful place. Yes indeed. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. This is yes, P.A.R. People uh, Activity Radio. And I am your gracious and humble host, John G. Horse. Horse. Hold on, family. Let me rock with that. You know how we do, family. Sometimes old John G. got to let this thing sizzle in his spirit. Uh. Yeah. It goes out to all you John Henry practitioners. Clocking in, clocking it out. I'm sorry, family. I had to get that uh, shoulder and head bob in. Sometimes old John G likes to cut jigs every now and then. It's a taboo pleasure. Of being a victim of racism, white supremacy, the global system that is. And again, this is John G. Horse, and you are now listening to PAR, People Activity Radio. And I am your gracious and humble host, John G. Horse. Welcome. You have found your family in a peaceful place. And today's title is, the title of today's episode is Family. Fannie Lou Hamer, sweet queen mother, mother, mother. Fannie Lou Hamer, 
No Limit Soldier, Fannie Lou Hamer. Rider, Fannie Lou Hamer. You understand me? Freedom Farms Co-op and the myth of black American cowardice. Let's get it in. And we're going to get into this work. You understand me? We're not going to have a long, drawn-out dissertation about our grand sister, Fanny Lou Hamer, sweet queen mother, no limit soldier, rider, the honorable Fanny Lou Hamer. I s- spent a little bit more time than usual uh, with the segment before my presentation. And I wanted to get all the little tidbits of information for those of you who like source material to refer back to the first 60 minutes of this show. If you want all the tidbits, dates, times, places, and events that our grandsister Fannie Lou Hamer showed anybody, spoke truth to power. You understand me? As it pertains to producing justice for people subject to black classification and or her group, her people, her fellow black classifieds. You understand me? Now, when we're talking about Fannie Lou Hamer, we're talking about a woman that was born in the deep so-called South, whatever that means. And she was born in a, a region that we know as Mississippi. You understand me? And you got to understand in the time that she was born, <laughs> uh, they were uh, subject to uh, sharecropping. Now, sharecropping is slavery by another name. You understand me? Now, what do you mean, old John G. Horse? Slavery was abolished in 1865. And I've heard you say on this show, old John G., that in 1865, our ancestors, our grandcestors, the black union troops, got our folk, our fellow black classifiers, off those terror squad plantations. plantations. And for the most part, that is true, but if you understand history and you understand the compromise of 1877, almost 10 years after, we got ourselves off them terror squad plantations. Now, what is the car- the compromise of 1877? Now, you got to refer back to the first 60 minutes of this show, but in a nutshell, the compromise of 1877 was people who classify themselves as white. Who were Republicans and people who classify themselves as white, 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 who were Democrats, decided that they were going to remove the Union troops from the southern region of the United States. They're going to remove the Union troops from the former Confederate states. And one of these former Confederate states is Mississippi, the birth state of the Honorable Grand Sesta, the Honorable Rider, the No Limit Soldier. Fannie Lou Hamer. And when they removed the Union troops from the South, that meant it was a green light free for all on the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, which were created from people subject to black classification, putting in that work, work, saving the Union. That meant that these new things that then they called the black codes were implemented all the black codes were all the black codes are is just a systematic federal government support supported state government sanctioned economic boycott of all things black black so if you were subject to black classification you were legally deterred you were legally exiled from any economic prosperity within the system that we call the United States of America. Federal government backed. Backed, backed. State government sanctioned. Sanctioned, sanctioned. And the enforcers of these black codes were the the domestic local law enforcement agencies which we know now and we know then were infiltrated by people who believed in the religion of white supremacy simultaneously classifying themselves as white. Uh, As we would say, 
the police force was infiltrated by people who nine times out of ten were in clan terror squads. You understand me? Now that being said, which brings this brings me back to Fannie Lou Hamer. She was born in this environment. I'm talking about cultural, terroristic, anti-black black, black. mistreatment. And she was born as a sharecropper. Now, a sharecropper, what the heck is a sharecropper? I played this in the first 60 minutes of this episode. Sharecropping is basically a system where people subject to black classification would live on the land and or the farm or plantation. And they were told they didn't have to pay rent. But the way that they earned their keep was to toil, farm the land for the landowner, formerly known as the plantation owner and or the slave master. master. Now at the end of the harvest, because you didn't own any farming tools, you didn't own any materials, you didn't own any, you didn't have any seed production everything that was given to you to farm and toil the land you were charged for and at the end of every harvest the landowner would tell you well you still did not pay me back for all that i have provided for you but i would allow you to stay here and keep on farming keep on practicing john henryism keep on working to can't see to can't see you understand me and maybe next harvest you'll level up and maybe able to get a profit to get up off of here but that leveling up that profit never came because systematically it was designed not to come systematically these folks were pretty much prisoners on the land that they worked you understand me now you're going to ask, how in the heck can that happen, old John G? Well, if any of my listeners live down here in the deep south, in Mississippi, in Texas, in Alabama, in Georgia, in Florida, in Tennessee, you understand me, in Carolina, you understand me, and all the other southern states, if you ever drove in the deep south from town to town, from com- community community it's a lot of isolation around that type of environment and isolation is strategically advantageous to those landowners who aspired to mistreat and or dominate non-white people in the area of sharecropping now i'm not gonna get all into that because we're supposed to be talking about sweet queen mother we're supposed to be talking about the No Limit Soldier. We're supposed to be talking about the rider. You understand me? Fanny Lou Hamer. Fanny Lou Hamer was born on a farm. You understand me? And she was born in a family of sharecroppers. She was the youngest of 20 children. Uh, Some way or another, Fanny Lou Hamer, while being terrorized, by, while being mistreated, while being exploited as a non-white black classified on this farm by the self white classified farm owner she found herself uh, one of the few individuals on that farm with the ability to add and subtract and to read and write you understand me which put her in a position of keeping the books now it's said in her story that once she was keeping the books she saw how the slave master and or the Landowner was manipulating, cooking the books to keep the non white, black classified workers, sharecroppers stuck on those terror squad plantations. At the end of every harvest, they were always a day late and a dollar short, meaning you got to stay here and work off what you owe me. And if somebody got the bright idea, in the 1930s, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, that you know what, I'm finna get off this plantation. I don't wanna be here no more. 
uh, pretty much they were made example of. They were executed on sight. They were hung. They were lynched. They were castrated. They were raped. They were dismembered. Anything that you can think of as it pertains to terrorism was done to non-white people subject to black classification in the United States, in the southern region of the United States, and in particular, in Fannie Lou Hamer's case, in Mississippi. But it wasn't just Mississippi. You understand me? It was a nationwide practice of mistreatment. Let's get back to the work. So if you decided that you wanted to escape, they take you off the planet. If you decided that you wanted to be paid more, they would take you off the planet. If you decided that you wanted to go to another plantation uh, who promised that they were going to pay you more and have better living conditions, you were taken off the planet. You understand me? Any evidence of insubordination was sudden death. Yeah. And if your family's on the plantation, if you, you I mean, you understand that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer is the youngest of 20. Now, how is her brother, her sister, her father, her mother going to leave? You're going to leave your whole family behind? This is a very complicated dynamic, and I urge all of you who find this information constructive, constructive, constructive. please research peonage slavery by another name and there is a sweet queen mother who does a lot of study study, study. on this particular subject and her name is Dr. Antoinette Harrell she was the genealogist featured in the Vice video that I played in the first 60 minutes of this show Show. Show. and she has multiple books multiple interviews multiple documentaries um, illuminating the practice of slavery all the way up to the 70s if I'm not mistaken I could be in error now let me get back to Fannie Lou Hamer this is the environment that she came up in and she did the only thing that she knew how to do because it was in her spirit you understand me when she was keeping those books for these corrupt landowners who were skewing the numbers who were cooking the books when she was bookkeeping she tipped the scales you understand me in the favor of the non-white black classifieds that were on those plantations now this could have meant sudden death amongst other things in this environment but she rode and she risked it all for her group now this was early uh uh evidence of who our grand sister was internally you understand me she was born with this because it takes a lot to rebel against an insurmountable system of mistreatment in these isolated Areas ain't no cavalry coming to save you. You're following me. Let's move on. Let's move on. So Fannie Lou Hamer uh, decided that things weren't right, and she went on a trek of producing justice, justice by any means necessary. You understand? Now, see, the beautiful thing about our grandsister story is it's kind of similar to um, our grandsister Malcolm X. Not exactly, you know, tit for tat, but the similarities is they both come from humble beginnings. You understand me? And they both, no matter what was placed in front of them, once they found knowledge of self, were dedicated, dedicated, dedicated to producing justice for people subject to black classification. And I'm not trying to take away from the grandsons of Fannie Lou Hamer, you understand me? Because you gotta understand, when Fannie Lou Hamer was riding for justice to be produced for people subject to black classification in Mississippi, including the nation, the nation, she was in an environment where bombs were bursting in air you understand me people was dying there was casualties all over the place you understand me while she was being chased by 
white extremists and white supremacists and clan members. Badge or no. You understand me? Police department wasn't protecting her. The state of Mississippi wasn't protecting her. Matter of fact, the state of Mississippi had an intelligence agency that was designed to neutralize justice producers like Fannie Lou Hamer. And I believe this intelligence agency was called the Sovereignty Commission of Mississippi. You understand me? Now, this is uh, part of a documentary called Spies of Mississippi that I think that those of you who find this information constructive would find uh, a lot of constructive value watching this documentary. I believe it was on the platform of PBS. It is called The Spies of Mississippi. Now, that being said, let's break down why I call our grandsister the No Limit Soldier because she keeps on coming. No matter what was thrown her way, no matter what shrapnel she caught, no matter what obstacles were placed in her path, you understand me? She kept coming. There is a term that is given to the black union troops after they saved the union they then got sent out to the western hemisphere of america in order to cultivate the land what that means is deal with those native americans who were not agreeable to people subject to black classification coming through doing what they do and it is said that those Native Americans in the many battles that they had with the Black Union troops gave them the nickname Buffalo Soldiers. Now, the nickname Buffalo Soldier was because they had dark, woolly hair and or manes like the buffalo. As well as, no matter how many times you shoot the buffalo no matter how many times you hit it with a bow and arrow until the buffalo is dead it keeps on coming you understand me and i'd like to say this is old john g's conjecture that our grandsister the no limit soldier the rider Rider. fanny lou hamer was indeed a buffalo soldier because no matter what they threw at her no matter what obstacles they placed in front of her face no matter what they did Did. physically spiritually or mentally she kept on coming coming until she transitioned now our sister uh went to get a medical procedure done in mississippi and i believe it was to remove a cyst from her abdomen area and it is said that when she woke up not only did they remove the cyst they removed they gave her an hysterectomy pretty much sterilizing our sister without any consent you understand me medical apartheid Dr. Harriet Washington please read that book that is a very constructive read Harriet Washington medical apartheid the dark history of the medical industry so while sister Fannie Lou Hamer was a victim of sterilization without consent now we're not even going to get into all the craziness that was happening on those plantations to our brothers and sisters, and I'm quite sure our sister, our grandsister, the rider, the No Limit Soldier, the Buffalo, Buffalo soldier, 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 was not exempt from all of the mistreatment that can happen on an isolated piece of land with no law, no law to people subject to black classification. Not gonna get into all that. This is what this is about. What I'm saying is, she survived it. Survived it. Survived it. You understand me? And in surviving it, she had to overcome medical mistreatment and medical terrorism. 
and then she decided that you know what we are people such as the black classification we don't even have the ability to vote so she said i'm going to ride for that now when she did that the plantation owner that she worked for told her if you continue trying to rile these negroes up getting them to vote we don't endorse that here on this plantation now old fanny fanny, fanny, fanny. your family been on this plantation for decades now you're gonna make it real uncomfortable for yourself and you may lose your job now losing a job is one thing but when you lose your job on these farms and or plantations that means you lose your living quarters because the job comes along with the living quarters can you imagine knowing nothing but that farm thinking that this is your home and you're being threatened with losing your job meaning losing your home where you and your kids gonna go and your husband you understand me fanny lou took it in stride and say right is right and i'm producing justice you understand me that is a soldier not a lot of people are going to go through with this justice trick you understand me so when doing that fanny lou was evicted, was evicted. and she lost the only job she knew you understand me now to the credit of the black classifieds surrounding our queen mother she was allowed to take up refuge uh in family members homes and friends of family uh one thing about black classifieds in those days they had no choice but to be communal so there were people who brought her in uh when she got evicted off of her out of her home and matter of fact the uh, farm owner made her husband stay on that plantation until the harvest was over then he got kicked off you understand me now during this eviction during this transition of her life while she was kicked out she was being chased by clans members now let me tell you something now these folk in these days didn't talk about it they'll tell you now we don't do that around here fanny I don't want you riling up these Negroes now. Now, they're going to tell you one time. If you continue doing what you're going to do, they're getting ready to take you off the planet. The planet. The planet. That's how it went down. Bombs are bursting in air. Dynamite was bursting all over the United States for decades after the Compromise of 1877. Anybody who showed any evidence of thinking that they were going to produce justice, white or black, was catching that TNT. You understand? Me in their homes in their churches. Churches, churches excuse my octaves family i told myself i'm not gonna do this i'm just gonna get the information i apologize for my excitement but see i'm like the weigh-in sister on living in color on living color when she used to talk about miss jenkins oh don't talk about miss jenkins well i'm talking about fanny lou hamer and i'm getting like that about the grand sister Fannie Lou Hamer. Don't talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. You understand me? Sweet Queen Mother, Rider, No Limit Soldier, Buffalo Soldier, Fannie Lou Hamer. Put some respect on her name. Now, she's ducking and dodging the clan who's shooting through houses, bombing everything wherever they think she is. And she continues to attempt to produce justice i mean this sister formed all type of cooperatives she formed the freedom farms cooperative to combat that terroristic system of sharecropping and peonage that people were subject to black classification was subject to she formed the freedom democratic party she was part of that because there was no representation in the uh, Dixie, Dixiecrat Party and or the uh, 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 Democratic Party of Mississippi. I mean, they doing all type of stuff. And I'm going to get to the point. One of the most famous things that she did, she went to a conference uh, that was designed to produce justice for victims of white supremacy subject to black classification in the state of Mississippi. And they had Martin Luther King. They had all type of articulate college graduate negroes up there and 
Fannie Lou Hamer gave that famous speech about what she had to go through when she was arrested by the state of Mississippi in the terror that the victims subject to black classification of Mississippi had to deal with in those terror squad jailhouses by way of suspected race soldiers and confirmed race soldiers pretending to be police officers who were fully infiltrated by the Ku Klux Klan amongst other white extremist groups. groups. But before she gave that speech, and you can hear the speech in the first 60 minutes of this episode, before she gave that speech, this is something that our sister gave, and this is why I call her the rider. This is why I call her the Buffalo Soldier. This is why I call her the No Limit Soldier. She keep on coming. Before she gave that speech, she gave her name, address to anybody who wanted to come see us. So let's tell you, let me tell you something about our grand sister. See, this is what I'm talking about. You can get into all of those things, those the nitpicky dates and times and organization names. Let me tell you about our sister and those who surrounded her because without protection around her, Fannie Lou Hamer wouldn't have did any of the work that she did. There was black males and black women that had no problem arming themselves and pulling triggers if need be to protect themselves and their riders and Fannie Lou Hamer was no different. She was a recipient of communal protection. Now, if we don't document this, if we don't produce this information, then we are not producing justice as it pertains to our legacy because Fannie Lou Hamer was known on record to tell anybody who would want to listen, I sleep with a couple guns underneath my pillow, underneath my bed, and near my hand. Because these individuals out here in Mississippi only understand one language. Bombs bursting in the air around this sister. The four little girls who were killed by Klan's members in Birmingham, Alabama. Adam A. Collins, 14 years old. Denise McNair, 11 years old. Carol Robinson, 14 years old. Cynthia Wesley, 14 years old. While Fannie Lee Hamer was dealing with death threats and dodging bullets and bombs. You understand me? James Cheney and those two white civil rights workers in 1964 who were murked and thrown into a a, a, a a trash area where they uh, 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 throw trash away in Mississippi was murdered during a time when Fannie Lee Hamer was being chased by hitters and dodging bullets and bombs. Our great rider, Medgar Evers, assassinated you understand me? During the same time, Fannie Lee Hamer was dodging bullets and avoiding TNT bombs going off. Bombs are bursting in air. 40 to 50 churches within 10 years bombed while Fannie Lou Hamer and countless homes bombed and hit with Molotov cocktails and bullets flying through their windows for anybody who wanted to show any evidence of attempting to produce justice in these United States. She kept on coming. You understand me? She didn't stop till she died. Fannie Lou Hamer was on a justice production trek. I didn't do her justice on this show, but I brought her name up. And I will ask any of us who find this information constructive, please do a little bit of research on the rider. On the No Limit Soldier, the Buffalo Soldier, Fannie Lou Hamer, who wouldn't stop coming for justice. You understand me? Died at the age of 59. I uh, believe she had cancer or something. You know, she, she left this earth too early. But let me tell you something. That's the sacrifice soldiers uh, always give they don't live a long life and 
the thing that frustrates old John G. Horse is this myth, this narrative that those of us subject to black classification just accepted mistreatment. Let me tell you something. Fannie Lou Hamer didn't accept no mistreatment, and those that were close to her didn't accept, accept no mistreatment. And we got to tell these stories of our riders and uh, dispel this myth of black American cowardice. And I hope, and I hope. I have contributed to less confusion. And always remember, keep learning and stay codified. classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Economic, economic education, education, entertainment, entertainment labor, 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 law, politics, politics religion, 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 sex, and war.